This is a, a great text um, for, for that kind of a launch point for me. And one I think that you'll find, once again, it just speaks right into our hearts as to where we are as individuals, as church. So uh, now that you're comfortable, please stand. And we're going to uh, read Acts 21. We're going to stop at verse 14, Acts 21 through 14. And please read out loud together with me. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come inside of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Thank you. Please be seated. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to bring up our trusty map and uh, real quickly just remind you where we are. Uh, we left off there in Miletus, and so now he has said goodbye to the elders from Ephesus. They have tra- sailed to Kos, down to Rhodes, and to Patera. Those are all just one-day trips. There at Patera, he is going to uh, board a very large merchant ship that is seaworthy of the open sea. Uh, can you even imagine that 2,000 years ago, what that would be like? And then um, he said, we came towards Cyprus, leaving it on our left, right? And ended up here in Tyre, in the country of Syria, in the region of Phoenicia. I love pointers. Now, uh, we kind of get to the point here where it says, and having sought the disciples, we stayed there, Tyre, for seven days. You know, the original thought here, just as a note, is to think, well, you know, they're waiting for the ship to be unloaded, then they're going to load it again and hop back on the ship and go south, but that's not what happened. I mean, th- that big ship would have just made its way back across the sea again. They would have just taken local smaller ships to hop down to Ptolemais and then down to Caesarea. So why did he stay a week in Tyre? I think because, this is just my theory, I think Paul got seasick. I really do. I mean, I think, I think he hated boats. I think he hated sailing. Uh, if you really track his travels, I mean, whenever possible, he'll just walk for days to avoid getting on a boat. And if you've ever been seasick, you know, and I, so all transparency here, uh, I am the great white fisherman. I literally spend most of my life on a boat, but I get seasick. It's the worst thing. Very embarrassing. Um, I got a story about that, but I won't tell it now. But uh, if you've ever been seasick, and particularly over the course of several days, when you get off the boat, the last thing you can possibly imagine is getting back on another boat, right? So I think Paul needed time to recover. That's just my theory. Now, they stay there for seven days, um, but they didn't waste that time. Look at verses four through six. And having sought out the disciples and stayed there for seven days, uh, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. 
Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. I, you know, I just want to point out something. I mean, there's no reason for us to believe that Paul had any contacts in Tyre that any of, of his team did. His team was from all over uh, Macedonia and Asia. So that would be the first time any of those people had ever been in Tyre. And so what you have here is a situation where Paul probably was sick. They needed a place to crash. Uh, they just begin to ask around at the seaport, do you know any crazy Jesus followers, right? And people say, yeah, those crazy people, they live up the street over there. And, and they, they make a connection with fellow believers. And in short order, they have a, a warm meal and a, and a warm bed to sleep in. And I just want you to know, that is kind of how it works all over the world. There is a deep connection with Christians. Uh, internationally, wherever you go, it, it is a, it's just this Christian fellowship and hospitality um, and it's really pretty remarkable when you meet a believer and you don't even speak the same language. Th this happens to me frequently in my travels around the world. But you literally can look into the eyes of another person who knows Jesus, who's been saved by Jesus, who loves Jesus, and it's like you're looking into the eyes of a brother or a sister, somebody you feel like you've known your whole life. And the door opens, and the hospitality is extended, and it's just a remarkable experience. One of the th reasons why I encourage you to to go on short-term mission trips, particularly ones that take you outside of your comfort zone into other cultures, because to see how uh, our shared faith in Jesus Christ and our love of God and, and the church uh, just creates family. You are one, listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of one of the largest, if not the largest family in all of history. And it is a remarkable thing uh, to celebrate. Sometimes we can't see that when we're just kind of in our small part of it. But uh, we have a big family, and it's a beautiful thing. And that's what, that's what we see here. Now, in Paul's case, the relationships grow so fast and so deep that after a mere seven days, the entire church, including, you know, the women and, and the babies and all the children, they all accompany Paul and his team down to the beach, to the seaport. And once again, we see this beautiful picture of them all kneeling on the beach, praying, saying goodbye just after a very short time. And, and I just want to point out, now a lot of times Paul comes across as kind of a tough nut, you know. But clearly, he was a very relational, caring, and gifted pastor who formed deep and meaningful relationships with people. Now note that these believers, uh, like others in other cities, have discerned through the Holy Spirit in their time of worship and fellowship that Paul is heading into certain trouble if he continues on this path to Jerusalem. Now, we, we know that this has kind of been a pattern. If you remember last week in Acts 20, verse 22, Paul says to the, the elders at Ephesus before he leaves on the ship at Miletus, he says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So apparently, ever since Paul left Corinth, made his journey back up through Macedonia, into Troas, then down to Miletus, wherever he's gone and been with Christians, people have felt a conviction through the Holy Spirit to tell Paul, hey, I, I, think, I think you're heading to trouble. I mean, we, we've, we sense that the Holy Spirit is saying, trouble awaits you. This has been a pattern. And once again, here uh, in, in Tyre, this group of believers uh, discerning the same thing. Luke writes, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, be careful that you understand the text is not saying, and the Holy Spirit said, do not go to Jerusalem, because that would, that would mean Paul is being blatantly disobedient, right? And, and we, that's not what it says. What it says is that through the Spirit, this group of believers was discerning Paul's heading to trouble, and they didn't want Paul to go into trouble, and so they're, they're saying, don't, don't go there. Uh, Paul obviously is going to keep going. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Look at verse 7. Uh, beginning with verse 7, we read, When he had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Once again, we'll throw the map up here just so you can see where we are. Uh, we were here in Tyre, we dropped down to Ptolemus for a day and down to Caesarea, and that's your major port city with a straight road into Jerusalem. So he's going to hang out there at Caesarea 
for a couple of days anyways. Remember that Paul's kind of trying to time his arrival into Jerusalem in the, in the, in the time and the season of Pentecost. And so he's going to hang out here for a couple of days and then make the journey up on the day of Pentecost. Paul and his team uh, reunite with a guy that we met earlier in the book of Acts, Philip, who was one of the seven deacons set apart by the church in Acts 6. And remember, Philip was also the guy who took the gospel up into Samaria and then was the one who led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord and baptized him. Uh, so that's, he's kind of a famous guy. I mean, he actually became called Philip the Evangelist. And uh, we learn in verse 9, Luke reports, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. What are we to make of that? Uh, well, first, let's acknowledge that Philip had real issues ever getting to use the bathroom in his house. <laughs> Saying it's been a challenge that. Second, Luke tells us nothing else. So, I mean, I have nothing else to make of this. Uh, it's such a weird thing. That, once again, if you're trying to make a case that the Bible is nothing but myth and legend, this is one of those awkward moments where you're like, well, that doesn't sound like myth and legend. I mean, that he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied, that's interesting, but what did they say? We have no idea. Luke just was like, hey, interesting point. Four daughters who prophesied, move on, right? They're pro probably prophesying the same thing that the others have been, that trouble awaits Paul, but we don't know that. The four prophesying daughters actually get upstaged by our old friend, the prophet Agabus. If you remember uh, back in Acts 11, and by the way, I don't expect you to remember this, but some of you might. Back in Acts 11, uh, we met this prophet Agabus who had come down from Jerusalem to the church up in Antioch in Syria and prophesied that a great famine was going to come upon the ancient Near East, if you remember that. And so Paul, on his missionary journeys, has actually been taking a, a, a love offering and bringing that offering back to the church in Jerusalem, who's now suffering. I mean, they're starving. This is a real intense time because of, of this famine. Uh, so you'll read about that in some of Paul's letters, how he's raising money for the church in Jerusalem and always asking people to help uh, their brothers there. So that's how you connect all the dots. But now, uh, Paul's hanging out with Philip in Caesarea, and here comes Agabus. Who knows if he was invited? Nobody really ever invites prophets to dinner. But Agabus comes, and uh, he takes Paul's belt, and he ties it around his hands and his feet, and he says there in verses 10, 11, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And Paul said to Luke, hey, doc, you want to borrow my belt? <laughs> no, I mean, the Holy Spirit is working through the prophet. If it hadn't been redundant enough, now this very kind of famous prophet literally shows exactly how he is going to be bound like this, right? The belt around his feet, around his hands, very graphic, very clear. This is coming, Paul, if you continue on the path to Jerusalem. This rattles Paul's team. Look at verse 12. When we heard this, Luke says, when we heard this, we and the people there urged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Uh, I hope that you can appreciate the power of this scene. You know, I mean, for weeks, maybe even months, the Holy Spirit has been revealing in every city and every time they stop with Christians that trouble was coming in Jerusalem. This is not new information for Paul. But so far, as of yet, he has not been deterred, right? His team has remained supportive. He has been confident in the Lord and he's going to make his way to Jerusalem and face his fate there, very much like Jesus did in his earthly ministry. But now... On this day, just 60 miles from the final destination after all the distance they've traveled, you have this very famous prophet, this very graphic prophecy about being bound and imprisoned. And his own team, Luke, Timothy, that group of, of his best friends and his disciples, all kind of turn on Paul and say, man, don't go. 
Don't, this can't be right. This cannot be God's will for your life. You, you know what? There's so much more you could do with your life, with your influence. Let's just go back to Asia. Let's go to Spain. Let's go to any place else but Jerusalem. Talk about feeling isolated. Paul, as a leader of his team, now feels completely alone in terms of this conviction to go forward with what God has laid upon his heart to do. And not unlike Jesus, Paul must now decide if he will allow the good intentions and advice and urging of his friends to dissuade him. Will he allow the majority opinion of those in the room to change his mind and his destiny? And of course, the answer is no. Look at verse 13. Paul responds, he says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And that is what you call courage. Now some people would say that is what you call being a bullheaded, stubborn idiot. That's just stupid. And you know what? You can actually even find a couple biblical commentators who really chastise Paul here and say that he was being disobedient to the Lord, that he was being stubborn. I don't think so. I mean, listen to what Paul's saying. He's saying to his friends, to his team, your well-intended efforts to save me from suffering are killing me. You are literally breaking my heart. Don't you understand that imprisonment and even death are just part of the deal for me as long as I'm being faithful to do what God has called me to do. Paul's not trying to be courageous simply because he's walking into suffering. Listen, Paul is courageous because he's pursuing the unpopular will of God, even though that means staring down his best friends and walking into what appears to be certain suffering. Paul's faith is really tested here. It's one thing to be tested by people who oppose you. It's another thing to be tested by your best friends, your team. But he passes that test. He's determined to pursue the will of God. So his team gets on board once again with Paul. We read in verse 14, and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of God be done. Uh, you know, this story, <laughs> it reminds me of the story of one of our new pastors, uh, Pastor Tammy Lundgren. Many of you have known Tammy. She's been a member of our church a long time. She came to the leadership of the church several years ago uh, with this sense of call. She first went to Pastor Bob and said, I feel called, uh, and I think God's called me to, to start seminary. And of course, Bob was like, you should do that. Let's, let's you, you know, 100% yes, do that. So the next step was for her to come to the elders of our church. We call that our session, if you're visiting with us. That's the gathering of elders. And that's protocol to come and, and confer with the elders and ask to come under care uh, of the elders of our church, under our presbytery and and that gives you a mentor and just the approval and affirmation and the prayers of, of the elders. So she, I remember this meeting because it was, a, it was not my finest hour as the lead pastor. Tammy came into that meeting and she began to share her sense of call to ministry. Her, she wanted to minister to women, to those struggling in marriages. I remember her saying something about becoming a speaker for women's events. She then said that she would begin by entering seminary. Well, those of you who know me know I had a fairly traumatizing experience in seminary. And so, of course, the very first thing that came into my mind is, is this mom with three small kids, you know, kind of in, in middle life, entering into seminary. And all I could imagine was that she would be devoured by liberal seminary professors like the ones I had at Princeton. I imagined her experience this terrible crisis of faith like I endured in my time in seminary. I imagined her having an intellectual meltdown like the meltdown that I had uh, for a season there. And so the very first words that came out of my mouth were, uh, Tammy, I don't think you need to go to seminary to pursue this particular call. I think there are many opportunities to do this kind of ministry without having to go through seminary. Pastor Drew Henderson, who was sitting next to me, who had a very similar experience at the Divinity School and Vanderbilt chimed in and said almost the exact same thing. Now, please understand, Pastor Drew and I loved Tammy, and we wanted what was best for our, our church member and her family. But for us, based upon our experience and our perceptions, that meant trying to talk her out of going into seminary. Tammy loves to uh, tell this part of the story with four simple words. 
Jim made me cry. <laughs> my wife, my wife literally, like the next day said, I heard you made Tammy cry. I was like, And I did. I'm not proud of it. My intentions were noble, but my words uh, tested Tammy's conviction and her call in a way that she did not expect to be tested. I mean, she expected resistance from some people in her life, but she didn't expect this kind of testing and resistance from her lead pastor and another pastor in the church, and it literally broke her heart. I remember seeing her tears and thinking to myself, dude, you're such a jerk. But that didn't change my mind. I really wanted to protect Tammy and her family from what I perceived as the potentially damaging effect of attending seminary. I'll never forget what happened next. Tammy kind of pulled herself together. She looked me straight in the eye and she said, "Um, I don't think you understand. I feel called to go to seminary, so that is what I'm going to do. I'm not asking for your permission. I'm going. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, last Sunday, Tammy Lundgren was ordained as a teaching pastor in the EPC. She aced seminary with a 4.0. She didn't have an intellectual meltdown. She didn't lose her faith. She passed the ordination exams with flying colors. She absolutely knocked it out of the park last weekend when she preached and was examined by the presbytery. I would like to officially declare I was wrong. Terribly wrong. But this happens, and there are many stories like this, where people feel a sense of call from God to go, and sometimes it's a call that potentially goes into hard places, and the people who should be supporting them, the people who should be rallying around them are oftentimes the people who throw up roadblocks out of their sincere concern for their safety or for their well-being, and uh, that, that happens. So, uh, you know, I want to just wrap up by addressing two questions that come from this text. How do we discern the will of God for our lives? And secondly, how do we muster the courage to pursue the will of God even when people try to talk us out of it? First, how can we discern God's will for our lives? You know, this could be obviously a a sermon series or certainly a sermon unto itself. I want to just give you a real short but, but I think helpful way to think about that. Uh, it, it's called the four councils, and this is, this is kind of a well-known thing, but I think many of us probably have not thought of it this way. You really have four councils that you want to listen to when it comes to discerning God's will for your life. The counsel of God's word, the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the counsel of your conscience, and the counsel of others. Let me just unpack that briefly for you. First of all, you're never going to know God's will for your life if you're not reading the Bible. Why? Well, because God has revealed his will for everybody's life in his word. And whatever you think that God might be calling you to, it will never contradict what he has already said. All right? So you have to begin by time in the word to hear God speak and to know what he has said and how that applies to your life. Secondly, um, you're not going to know God's will until you ask him. Right? We have to seek the Lord and ask him what uh, his will is for our lives. And he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit, and that is in that conversation and prayer. So discerning the will of God requires a season, long season, of of pursuing the Lord and listening carefully through prayer. The third counsel is the counsel of your conscience. Now, this is not nearly as reliable as the first two, but it is important. You know, for most of us, if we're Christians, our conscience has been forged by the law of God. And so we know right from wrong, right? by by virtue of this objective standard that everyone is accounted to, the Ten Commandments, the law of God. And so if your sense of call from God comes between doing what is right and doing what is wrong, then your conscience can be your guide because your conscience should be able to discern right from wrong based upon the law of God. And that can can help us discern God's call and and take the appropriate steps to pursue it. Uh, Unfortunately... I'm concerned more about this counsel for a lot of people in our culture because we have a culture that is increasingly narcissistic. We become narcissistic when we are not raised with any objective standard of right and wrong. It's always just a nuanced sense of better and best. And so consequently, uh, we have many people in our culture now who don't have a conscience. 
They, they can sin and break God's law, and they, they feel no regret or remorse whatsoever. That's a very disturbing fact. But for the Christian, your conscience should definitely help you in discerning God's will. All right? The fourth council is simply the council of what we would call the council of elders, the council of other believers who come around you, who know you, who love God, who pray and discern uh, and, and seek to help you in your discernments. So that is what Tammy was doing when she came to the session. Uh, that didn't go great, but I just want you to know all the other elders were very supportive of her going to seminary, as I was too once I saw her determination of her call. But most of us do need help discerning the call of God from others. You know, uh, even the ones who challenge our call, and test it, can help refine and, and really kind of lock in what God's calling us to do. So I think the counsel of others is incredibly important. It's not authoritative, but it is important, right? So that's just a quick um, teaser around these four councils, but really it's not, it's not rocket science. These four councils are the way most of us go about discerning God's will for our lives. Now, the harder question, I think, is how do we muster up the courage to pursue the will of God? How will we know we're on the right track, particularly when we're tested and maybe people that love us are trying to encourage us not to go there? right? So just three things. Number one, to pursue the will of God will always mean to some degree that by going there, our life is looking more like the life of Jesus. I mean, that's how you'll know you're on the right track. And and that's what pursuing the, the, the will of God will mean. Think about it. Jesus lived the perfect human life. He pursued the will of the Father perfectly in his earthly life and ministry, and his obedience led him where? To Jerusalem right? The place of great suffering and even death where everybody was trying to tell him not to go. When we look at Paul's determination to go to Jerusalem, it literally reminds us of the life of Christ. In both cases, there was the prediction that they'd be handed to the Gentiles. There was a triple prediction of coming suffering. They both demonstrated steadfast determination, and they were both tested immensely, right? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, tested by his friends who tried to talk him out of it. And and in both cases, they resign to God's will. Thy will be done, right? Our path may not literally lead us to the city of Jerusalem, but I suspect that many of us have been called to go to the place that scares us the most, a place that people warn us not to go. And yet we cannot deny God's call to absolutely go there. Now, for some of us, uh, our Jerusalem means walking into a confrontational conversation with a loved one who's in denial regarding their addiction. You know, for, for some of us, our Jerusalem is, is going forward and engaging somebody and just telling the truth about our own condition, about our situation. For some of us, Jerusalem is, is going to the CEO and reporting fraudulent activities by our coworkers. Some of us are called to risk sharing the gospel with some very difficult people in our Jerusalem who may mock us and reject us, and still we know that is God's call regardless of the outcome. Still others, like Tammy, are called to pursue vocational ministry. Here's what I can tell you. If your life is becoming more like Jesus, he is absolutely going to call you at some point to Jerusalem. A hard place to go where you know this is not going to be easy, this is going to be messy, this is going to be hard, and there's probably going to be well-intended people around you who are going to try to talk you out of it, and you're going to be in that place of trying to discern God's will and pursue it. Number two, to pursue the will of God is to not be a man-pleaser. Paul writes later in Galatians 1.10, for I am seeking, for am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know what? As a Christian, you have an audience of one. You exist to please and serve God. His approval matters more than anyone else's. His opinion of you matters more than your opinion of you or anyone else's opinion for that matter. So the hardest test that you're going to face in pursuing God's will is the test that Paul faces here in Acts 21. When everyone, apparently including Paul's best friends and teammates, literally tried to talk him out of pursuing God's will. 
You know, this happened to Jesus. If you remember, Peter, his very best friend, the lead disciple, when Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die there, they're going to kill me. And Peter said, no, no, I'm not going to let that happen. No, you cannot go. And what did Jesus say in Mark 8, 33? Get behind me, Satan, for you were not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, admittedly, that was a little harsh, right? But let's face it. Our friends' best intentions for us do not always reveal the will of God. There are times when we must trust God and obey his call even when we feel completely alone. And I'm telling you right now, those are very difficult times indeed. Uh, many of you know my story uh, about how we ended up going into India. And since I'm heading there tomorrow, I'll just kind of tell you that story in light of what we see here in Acts 21. It's a great story. Uh, it began in... Uh, early, really late 2012, several of us as leaders of the church went to a, a conference called the Iskar Summit. And at that conference, all of the major mission agencies of the world had come together. It was one of the unprecedented times of cooperation. They had done all the research, and they began to share where we are in terms of the gospel reaching every tribe and tongue, every language in the world. They, they had it literally spelled out of which villages and in which parts of the world had never heard the gospel. And they challenged every church leader, every church, to play its role in bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth to those unreached people groups. And all of us who were there at that conference looked at each other and said, you know what, Colonial does a lot of great things, but we are not in that game, and we need to be. We need to do our part of helping the gospel reach unreached people groups. Now, during that conference, they played this video of this church down in Texas who had taken the Gospel of Luke and everyone had adopted a verse and, and paid for the translation and that was made into a, a Jesus film and that went to reach a people group. And we thought, hey, let's just do that. We didn't really pray about it. We just said, that looks great. And we like the Gospel of Luke, so let's go do that. So over the next few months, as we're getting closer and closer to our 60th anniversary where we're gonna have the whole church come together and we're gonna cast a great vision for 2013 Part of it's going to be reach unreached people groups. We're working on this project. And two weeks before the big event for Palm Sunday 2013, the whole project tanked, completely tanked. I won't go into details, but I'll never forget. We, we had been trying. The whole thing just fell apart. My executive director, Randy Sheen, felt sitting there with me. And we're looking at each other saying, and almost at the same time said, this isn't it. This is not what God wants for our church. We're two weeks away, right, from the big event. So I walk out of my office. I'm out at the Warnell campus. I head down to the coffee machine because that's what you do <laughs> when you're at a loss, right? And I'm, I'm complaining to God. I'm crying out. I'm like, what in the world? I don't get it. I mean, I know you want us to be involved in this part of, of ministry, but that's not it. I got two weeks. I got nothing. So I get my cup of coffee, I look over to the left of the terrace room there, and the, the citywide prayer is gathered in that room on Thursday morning. So I, I go in there, I sit down, they're praying, I just bow my head, and I'm just praying. I'm praying to God, Lord, show me what you want us to do. I don't get it, I don't understand why this whole thing's falling apart two weeks away from the big event. We get done praying, and this little guy from India pops up, Pastor Sam Stevens from the Indy Gospel League, just happens to be in my church just happens to stand up at that very moment and come and cast vision for a collaborative partnership of Kansas City churches to come together and join the Indie Gospel League to plant 520 churches in five years in the unreached people group of Orissa, India. I said, well, that'll work. You know, I mean, that, that amazing, right? So I, I went, I met Sam, instant connection with this guy. The next day, he's sitting at my kitchen table. He's got the entire proposal laid out. It's super organized. It's extremely compelling. And then he gets on a plane and flies back to India. Now, I've got two weeks to try to convince my staff and the elders, hey, we're not going to do the scripture translation, but I met this guy. You can kind of imagine how that went. Not great. Uh, you know, I mean, I tried to convince people. I tried to get them to read materials. I tried to explain the whole story with meeting Sam. But all I kind of got was the deer in the headlights from the elders saying, whoa, what? I thought we were doing the scripture translation. You were kind of excited about that. Now it's like the 11th hour and you're wanting to do what? 
And it was spring break. Sorry, like everyone was fleeing and heading out of town. And so the Friday night before the Sunday, Palm Sunday, big event, all of us gathered in one room. You remember this, right? Our 60th anniversary. I call an emergency session meeting. People show up. I'm like, come on, guys. This is awesome. You're going to love this. And after, you know, about an hour, they took a vote. And the answer was no. No. You may not, pastor, we love you, but no. You may not go and make this commitment for us to get engaged with this organization. We know nothing about them. We don't know their theology. We don't really, we don't know anything. You know, Sam, that's not enough. We, we, you know, if we had more time, maybe, but the answer is no. So I go home. I'm standing in my kitchen sink that night washing a pan or something. And I'm about to have just a complete breakdown. I'm telling my wife, I'm complaining about this whole situation. And I finally just said, you know what? This is God's problem. Because I am not in doubt that he put Sam Stevens on my path when I was asking what am I supposed to do But I can't disobey the elders of our church. I mean, that's the way that God put the government of the church together. So he's going to have to solve this problem. But I have 48 hours and I have nothing. This whole big part of the vision, I've got nothing. So I go to bed that night and uh, got my phone plugged in there on the nightstand. And I look at it for the forecast for Sunday. Two inches of snow. I'm like, oh, great. Two inches of snow. That's just enough for the old people to stay home. Right? (laughs) They're not, they're not going to come out with two inches of snow. We're going to have half the building empty. We're going to have paid all this money for this great event. And, and I don't even have anything to say about the big piece of it. And I mean, I was just not a very happy camper. But I prayed. I said, God, I don't know what to do. This is your problem. Woke up the next morning. Looked at my phone for the forecast, as I do. I'm a weather guy. And it says, forecast for Sunday, 12 to 14 inches of snow. I called Randy Shanefield. I'm like, are you watching the news? We're watching the news. All the newscasters are like, really remarkable. Like, we thought it was going to be two inches, but uh, that's, I think it's going to be 12 to 14 inches. I'm like, I think we're going to have to cancel. (laughs) We called the Ritz Charles. They pushed it back three weeks. I immediately got on the phone. I called Randall Litter, and I called the impact committee. I called all the elders. I was like, all right, you needed more time. You got it. Let's go. Let's go research. Let's talk to everybody we know. Let's, let's do a report. In two weeks, we're going to meet together, and we'll hear your report. Please, 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 go find out. I'm not in doubt, but you are, so let's go find out what you need to know. And they did. They researched everybody. They talked to their financial. They got financial reports. We got theological statements. We talked to stateside partners who had partnered with Indie Gospel League. And two weeks later, we sat there, and the elders wept when we learned how God had moved through this ministry completely transformed villages with the gospel. And it was a unanimous yes. That day, five years ago, we cast the vision for Colonial to partner with other local churches to go plant 520 churches in this unreached area. I'm happy to tell you that in the past four years, over 300 churches have been planted in these unreached villages. Churches consist of 20 baptized believers who are gathered together in people's homes. The year after we got started, the prime minister changed, and it became very dangerous. Some of those people who came to the Lord who became church planners are now dead, martyred. But thousands of people have been set free. Their testimonies are consistent. This Jesus healed me. This Jesus set me free from demons. This Jesus provided for our family in the most remarkable way. And that gospel continues to spread in that region because many of you caught that vision. Over $340,000 have been given in support from this church. Not one of those dollars came from the missions budget. Just came from families saying, we want to be part of that. We've been praying every night for four years for the church planners in India to prevail. And in just a few days, I will stand before hundreds of those church planners. And I just want to say, do what God puts on your heart to do. Stay the course. The last piece of pursuing God's will is just what we learned here. 
you got to learn, believe, and trust that God is sovereign. He is capable. That snowstorm on Palm Sunday 2013, by the way, that was the last major snowstorm that we've had in Kansas. It's been five years. It just reminded me, God is sovereign. He can and will absolutely accomplish his purpose. Our job is to be faithful and to trust him. My conviction regarding the perfect sovereignty of God has increased dramatically even in the past several months. When Pastor Greg Ely texted me at 9.30 p.m. on August 15th to inquire about our position as a Warnell campus pastor, two hours after our session for the first time in 10 years, repented for racism in our church. At the very moment that the chair of the search committee, Ken Kurtz, stood up to give his report on that committee, I get, hey, dude, (laughs) you can't make that up. God is sovereign. He is moving, and he is going to accomplish his purpose. He's looking for his church. He's looking for you and for me to pray and obey, to trust him, even when other people try to talk us out of it. Watching Tammy Lundgren, Jess Sparks, Corey Osmond, and Mark Potter be ordained into the gospel ministry last Sunday on our stage, become ordained teaching pastors of the EPC. Man, I tell you what, it just made me see how God led our church out of our former denomination for such a moment as that. Church, trust God more than you trust yourself or anything else. Obey God even when others think it is in your best interest not to do so. Discern and pursue the call of God that he has placed on your life regardless of the cost and enjoy the great stories and rich friendships along the way. Will you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you for amazing stories, one after another, of how you are accomplishing your will through ordinary people. And we pray that we would be part of that great story, that we would not shy from being your people, faithful and obedient to pursue the call you place upon our lives. Help us to discern it. Give us the courage to pursue it. In Jesus' name, amen.